Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Um, I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you today about uh, biblical fasting. Biblical fasting. That's what we're going to use our time today to do. And the reason why I want to really touch on this subject is because, as you know, we're coming up on our first quarter fast. This is the first fast that we've scheduled for this year. Uh, we've scheduled three for this year. This is our first fast, the first quarter fast, four of this year, I'm sorry, four this year. And uh, this is the first ones coming up this week. And uh, so I, I felt... Since we're coming up on a fast, it's probably a good idea to talk a little bit about fasting. He said, well, I don't need any information about fasting. Well, somebody does, amen. <laughs> you know, we, we do a lot of things in church that everybody is not so much hip on. Everybody's not informed concerning uh, a lot of things, and I believe fasting is one of those things. And I want the, the body of Christ, I want this congregation uh, to get the most out of this time of fasting. So we're going to take some time to talk about it on today. How's that sound? So let's talk about fasting, the importance of fasting. I want to answer some questions that you might have regarding fasting, like what is the right way to fast? What is the right way to fast? Also, is biblical fasting only about abstaining from food? We know that, you know, there is in the natural, a lot of dietary plans may incorporate fasting. A lot of things that you do in the world may incorporate fasting. We know that fasting re, uh, involves abstaining from food. But does biblical fasting, the fasting spoken of in the Bible, is it just about not eating? And then lastly, I hope to answer the question, are, are there any benefits to biblical fasting? That is, other than saying, I did it. I went through the fast. You know, like a notch on our belt. Now, the church had a fast. I went all the way through the fast without eating. Hooray. Are there benefits of fasting, again, other than saying we did it? Well, first we need to understand regarding physical fasting is that biblical fasting isn't simply about abstaining from food. I repeat, biblical fasting isn't just about not eating. True biblical fasting combines the physical act of not eating with spiritual elements like worship, repentance, prayer, humility, Bible meditation, these types of things, forgiveness. If we simply abstain from food without incorporating any spiritual element like the ones I just quoted, then our fasting will become invalid, say invalid, invalid. in the eyes of God. Isaiah 58, turn over there, Isaiah 58. It's important for us to understand as we head into this season of fasting, this week of fasting, that biblical fasting isn't just about not eating. In order to truly be on a fast, in order for God to recognize our fasting, 
then we must incorporate spiritual elements with our physical act of not eating. As I said, like repentance, faith, humility, kindness, some of these things. And I'm going to show you um, here in Isaiah 58 how the Bible points this out. In Isaiah 58, verse 3, Isaiah 58 and 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Well, behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. You exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. You smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So in Isaiah's day, the people were disappointed because although they were fasting, it seemed that God wasn't recognizing their fasting. They were going through times of fasting, corporate fasting, and they were like, you know, we're, we're, we're having these uh, uh, holy days of fasting, and it seems like God is not even answering. We're getting no benefit from it. And God says to them, you're not getting any benefit because you're only abstaining from food. But while you are abstaining from food, you are not abstaining from evil conduct, wicked actions. You're continuing in your same behavior while you're supposed to be honoring me through a fast. He says, this is not, say not, this is not how you are to fast, he tells them. He says their fasting was nullified by their wicked behavior. In fact, he spends this entire chapter going into detail about what is required in order to participate in a true biblical fast. So the whole chapter of, of Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58, this whole chapter is, is about God revealing to Israel how to participate in a biblical fast. And we're going to take a look at it today. Look at verse 4. Notice what he requires when we are on a true fast. Isaiah 58 and verse 4. Behold, you fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So he says here, when you fast, you are not to be fasting, abstaining from food, while you are engaging in strife and debate. If you're on a fast and you're constantly arguing and quarreling with your neighbor, then you are nullifying your fast. And if anybody ever been on a fast, this is one of the temptations. Put it this way. This is one of the results of taking food from people. It seems that when we stop eating, when we go without food for extended periods of time, oh, we start fighting and arguing. That's right, we get very irritated. You've seen the Snicker commercial, you know. They're acting all crazy and out of character, and they say, oh, you need a Snicker. Then when they eat the Snicker, then they change, and they're back to themselves, you know, they're back. To... And so what, this is what he's saying, and this is what I want to say to you. When we go on this fast, be very careful. Say, I'm listening. I'm listening. Be very careful that when you go on a fast, that you don't engage in a lot of arguing and fighting. 
Because if you do, then God says, I'm taking no, no note of your fast. You're, you're nullifying it. You, you, you will get no benefit from it. You're, you're basically just starving. It, it's no spiritual quality to it. He goes on to say here, not only were they arguing and fighting, he says that their arguing and fighting often led to physical violence. You smite with the fist. You know? So, you know, look, this is really bad. That when we stop eating, not only do we argue with people, but we're ready to go to blows, as the young people say. Be careful that you don't do your fasting this way. Be careful that when you're going through your fast, that you're not fighting with your children. You're not fighting with your spouse. You're not fighting with coworkers. You're not involved in road rage in your commute to work. Somebody say abstain from evil behavior. So there, when you're on, a, when you're on a, a fast, a spiritual fast, you can't just think about not eating. You've got to also don't act like the devil. Amen, somebody. He goes on to say, verse 5, Isaiah 58, look at verse 5. He gives us something else here. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow his head as a bulrush, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every. He's saying, look, what makes your fast acceptable is not you looking pitiful, bowing your head like a bulrush, oh, holy God. He said, is this what I'm asking for? When I call for a fast, is this what I'm looking for? A bunch of people walking around, you know, just looking solemn and sad. Is that what I'm looking for? He says, no, this is what I'm looking for. This is the fast that's acceptable to me. You want to fast in a way that I will recognize? Start setting the captives free. Everyone who is bound, loose them. Break the bands of oppression. Words like loose, break, cancel. You know what these words represent? Forgiveness. I said they represent forgiveness. In Isaiah 58 and 6, for instance, in the Message Bible, it reads, this is the kind of fast I'm after to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, watch this, cancel. Cancel what? Yeah. Cancel debts. What does it mean to cancel a debt? Well, Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He is associating forgiveness with canceling We've heard it. They call it debt forgiveness. There are some people that owe you some stuff. Guess what? You're supposed to say, say what? Okay. When you're on a fast, you're supposed to be doing debt. You owe me some money? Not anymore. People who have offended you, you say, you know what, guess what? I'm good. You should be canceling all that, forgiving everybody of everything. 
ask the Lord, Lord, reveal every, every offense I'm holding in my heart. Remind me of everything I'm holding over someone. You're going to be canceling that. You're going to be telling your kids, you, you should be glad I'm about to go on a fast because I'm about to let all y'all off the hook, you know. The whole family should be rejoicing whenever a pastor calls for a fast. That means whatever I was under, oh, I'm on punishment in Jesus' name. I said, no, that don't mean that. Okay, okay, now hold on. You say that only because you don't really know why they would be fasting to begin with. Israel often fast many times, and one of the reasons, and we'll get into this a little bit later in more detail, but one of the reasons why they were fast is because they had fallen into sin and they wanted God to release the judgment. Whenever the people would sin and, and commit wickedness and fall under God's judgment, the prophets, the kings, would call for a fast, hoping that this act of fasting would be seen as an act of repentance and whatever was over them, God would cancel it. And guess what God is calling us to do? Again, you're supposed to say, say what? God is, I don't know why. God's requiring us to do what we're hoping to get from him. When you're on a fast, he's saying, do what you want me to do. If you want me to cancel some debts, then you need to be busy canceling. If you're truly seeking forgiveness from me, then you need to be giving it. Forgive us even as we forgive. In Ephesians chapter 4, don't turn there, let me read it for you. In Ephesians 4 and 31, we see this, let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, watch, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has done what? Forgiven you. We're supposed to be doing what we hope to receive from God. And so to truly go on a fast, not only, not only are we to refrain from acting in the flesh, we're also to make sure that we participate in mercy kindness, forgiveness. That's how you fast. Don't fight, but forgive. Forgive everybody, everything. All the, the whole time you're fasting, you should be in forgive mode, mercy mode, debt canceling mode, or else you're just dieting. Hallelujah. Oh, I don't know if I could do that. That's difficult. Yeah, fasting hurts. <laughs> and it's supposed to hurt more than your stomach. It's supposed to hurt your flesh. Your carnal desires. Hallelujah. Go back. Isaiah 58. Let's look at verse 9. He gives us another one. Isaiah 58 and verse 9. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. If, here's the condition, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke and the watch, putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. So here in verse 9, he gives us, Another thing that we are to incorporate in our fasting. 
He says, if you want God to hear you when you're praying, when you're fasting, then put away the putting forth of the finger. And that's an expression that refers to being critical and judgmental. So when you're going on a fast, he says, stop being critical and judgmental. I mean, we could be very critical of everything. Oh, you know, I wouldn't have did that. You know, oh my God, here we go. And we're always putting our finger out and saying, shame, 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 shame. Ready to condemn anything and everyone. But when you go on a fast, take that finger and stick it in your pocket. No more wagging your finger at people. No more wagging your finger. Put away the finger. Stop being critical. Because God can be critical of you. Fasting reminds us what we should be doing all the time anyway. This is how you be holy before God. Put away the critical finger. No judging. No condemning. Not when we're on a fast. Oh, we got to be holy. Put away the temptation. You know, because we get pleasure out of that. Yes, we do, or else we wouldn't keep doing it. There's, there's a certain amount of a, a pleasure we get from judging people and being critical. It's like a pat on our back that we're able to identify your errors. Look how much discernment I got. You know, we call it discernment, but really it's being critical. Hmm, I'm not getting any amens. I must... I must be on good ground right there in Jesus' name. We're talking about how to fast. It's not just about abstaining from food. It's not just about not eating. It's also about not acting in an evil manner. Not judging. Not holding grudges. Here's another one, verse 13, Isaiah 58 and 13. If thou, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thine own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways or finding your own what? Now, some of you might be confused. I thought he was talking about fasting. Why is he mentioning the Sabbath? This is because when they would call for a corporate-wide fast, that is, when, when the whole nation would be called to fast, it would become like a holy day, a holiday, a holy day, a Sabbath. And on this holy day, this day of fasting, God says, you ought to treat it like you treated a Sabbath. Don't do your own pleasure. So when you're on a fast, it's not about you, you know, uh, continuing in your everyday activities. It's, it's about abstaining from your normal activities. And spending your time while you're on this fast doing what pleases God. Amen. So you can't fast and, 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 and be going to the sports game or, or watching the game or, or, or enjoying your favorite, you know, program on television. Going to the amusement park. Playing golf. Anybody out there? Yeah. Bowling, whatever you like to do, whatever you enjoy doing, fasting is not a time for you to be enjoying yourself, doing what pleases you. Instead, fasting is a time where we need to be doing what pleases God. You know what pleases God? For us to be meditating on the word day and night. You know what pleases God? For us to seek his face continually. You know what pleases God? For us to be involved in worship and praise. 
This pleases the Lord. This pleases our spirit. Well, that's boring to you, but not to your spirit. You know, see it so many times. You know, you got people fasting, and they just watching television. No, no wonder you're hungry. You keep seeing these commercials. <laughs> Pastor, I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, listening to your favorite radio program. You know, this is this is not how we fast, saints. Now, some people say, "Oh, yeah." I already knew that. Well, some people didn't know this. Again, some people think that being on a fast is just not eating. But they go about their daily activities as they normally would. You better be careful. This is not about you pleasing yourself or getting pleasure. It's about doing what pleases the Lord. Can we see this? Let's look back at verse 13. He goes on to say, he says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. Thou shalt honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure. Here's the last part. Nor speaking your own words. Nor speaking your own words. I love what the uh, 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 New Jerusalem Bible says. It says, if you refrain from breaking the Sabbath from taking your own pleasure on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath delightful, sacred to Yahweh, honorable, if you honor it by abstaining from travel, seeking your own pleasure, and from too much talk. How many know we talk to merch? We merchy. So when we on a fast, guess what we need to be doing? Shutting our mouth. Child, what you doing? Child, I don't know what you doing. Oh, Pastor got us on this fast, girl. My God. And let me just add this. Talking in the 21st century could mean making a lot of posts on Facebook, you know. Tweeting. Instagramming, I don't even know if that's a word, but I mean, just they call it chatting. Keep it to a minimum. Come on, somebody. Because the Bible says, in much words, there is no shortness of sin. That is, people who talk a lot, there's some sin over in there. You just keep talking. You, you, I, I ain't sinned all day. I could tell by the, how much you talk. You said something you shouldn't have been saying. Amen? So we, won't, we don't want to fall prey to that. So what we want to do, we want to, you know, we want to keep our mouth shut. Put a hand over our mouth. Not talking so much when you're fasting. You, you should be slow to speak, quick to hear. God, what are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying? Amen? Praise God. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I want to cover one last thing before I end today. Hallelujah. How many thank God for this little teaching on fasting that I never knew? Okay, yeah, so we're going to get the most out of this fast. You know, if you don't eat, you might as well get something out of not eating. My God. I need to die. Yeah, you do. Amen. But I'm not putting the church on a fast because some folk need to lose some weight. You do that on your own. How many appreciate pastor not trying to haul the whole church to the gym? Amen. Just send them ones who are overweight to the gym. Why we all got to go? My blood pressure is normal. I don't need to go over there. They, they need to go. You ever see these people, you take them out, they want you to eat what they eat. I'm not eating that. I'm eating some ribs. I don't need that. You eat salad. I don't want salad. I want some. We just came from vacation. I come all the way to vacation to eat no salad at no restaurant. And drink no Diet Coke. I'm, I'm eating 
in Jesus name I told my wife I, if you call it cheating I don't know what you call it but I'm eating what I want to eat I'm on vacay <laughs> a saints pray pastor we've got him in the hospital You're over amen I'm like Frank so I did it my way <laughs> Matthew 6 amen Matthew 6 I'm teasing only a little bit <laughs> Matthew 6 16 Matthew 6 16 moreover this is Jesus here he says moreover when you fast be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But thou, when you fast, anoint your head. Take a bath. Shower. Wash your face. That thou appear not unto men to fast but unto thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee oh man he said a lot here he said a lot here one of the first things i want you to see is that jesus is here clearly endorsing fasting and the reason why i say that is because so many Christians believe that fasting was done away with in the New Testament. That Jesus nor the apostles endorsed fasting. We're no longer required to fast just like we're no longer required to offer sacrifices of bulls and goats. That passed away. No, oh, no, man. You know, you see people fasting. Oh, you know, they need another dip. They, they, they don't know anything. Who your pastor? Oh, he hadn't taught you. He ain't taught you the real truth. You know, the real truth is we don't need to fast anymore. Well, or clearly you didn't tell Jesus this. Jesus didn't get the memo. Oh, Jesus, you got to be careful. Now, Jesus was talking to Jews. Ah, but he said, when the bridegroom is here, the, the children don't fast. But when the bridegroom is taken away, they will fast. And he was speaking of himself. He's the bridegroom. And he says, when I went away. Now, we know when he went away, the church had already been established. He says, what will the children be doing? What will the disciples be doing? Fasting. It's okay. It's okay. Even the apostle Paul says, he's fasted. The, fasting is part of the discipline for every disciple. It's important. It's so important, say, I'm listening, that Jesus says there is a reward connected to it. Fasting is so important. He says, if you do it, I'm going to reward you. There's value in it. There's a benefit in it. Now, he says, you don't get any benefit just because you look like you're fasting. And that's not new to us because we just saw there in, in Isaiah 58 that, you know, just hanging your head like a bulrush and, you know, that's what God, God doesn't want that. God's not, God's looking at the heart. What are you doing on the inside? And notice Jesus says, if you do it the right way, if you participate in a proper fast, you will receive a reward. Now, we've talked to you about how to properly fast, but we haven't yet said what are the benefits of fasting. And this is what I want to touch on before we end today. The benefits, somebody say the benefits of fasting. You know, the first benefit of fasting is overcoming temptation. If you fast the right way, you will receive power to overcome temptation. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Go back a few pages. Mm -mm -mm. Anybody tempted with some things? Anybody has some weights and some sins that you can't get, seem like you can't get rid of? You can't shake a monkey on your back. 
Yeah, y'all looking at me like y'all quite holy, but I know that's just how you look. It ain't the truth. Some of you have a problem cussing. Some of you have a problem smoking. Some of you have a problem fornicating. Some of you have a problem with pornography. Some of you have a problem with anger. Some of you have a problem with depression and worry and anxiety. You love God. You love the word. You even fill with the Holy Ghost. But you just can't seem to get deliverance. Well, let me give you a secret. One way to overcome temptation is to put a fast on it. Oh, it'll break the power. How can you be so sure? Because this is how Jesus overcame temptation. He didn't overcome temptation because he was the son of God. He overcame temptation through fasting. I'm going to show you. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up up of the spirit into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. To be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40, aren't you glad pastor didn't put you on a 40 day fast? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Say I ain't ready for that yet. That's Jesus. <laughs> Somebody say you win. <laughs> you can win. You win Jesus. Amen. <laughs> you win. I don't want that title. You can have it. Praise God. Uh, after 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward unhungered. Verse 3, and when the tempter, and when the tempter came, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he, that is Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live. Man shall not live, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out. Now, whenever we talk about the temptation of Christ and his overcoming the devil's temptation, we so often limit that conversation to Jesus' use of the word of God. Jesus overcame Satan's temptation because he kept quoting the word, which is true. And, and we do not want to uh, belittle that. We, we do not want to make small of the fact that the way we overcome the enemy is through the word of God and our confession of that word. But that wasn't the only thing Jesus did in order to overcome the devil. The Bible specifically says that it was after he had fasted 40 days that he overcame the temptation. Now, if fasting wasn't important in Jesus overcoming, I mean, oh, Jesus wouldn't have did it. There's a lot of things Jesus didn't do because he was a Jew. Didn't do it. Didn't do it because it wasn't necessary. Everything Jesus did was important. He fasted 40 days because it was important in his overcoming temptation. We quote many times that passage in Revelation, and they overcame him, meaning the devil, and they overcame with the word of their testimony. That's not what it only says. Not only did they overcome him with the word of their testimony, they also overcame him because they loved not their lives unto death, meaning they were willing to sacrifice their life. That's how you overcome. It's not just with the word, but your willingness to lay down your life. And when I say your life, I don't just mean your physical breath. I mean your desires, your passions, because what temptation makes you think is you can't live without this. You can't live without food. You can't live without sex. Can't live without covetousness. That's why you got to do it. Got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, you got to. And then the devil will throw this in. It's your right to. That's what he told Jesus. It's your, aren't you the son of God? It's your right to eat. 
I never saw a son of a king, a prince, starving to death. Isn't it your right? Are you truly the son of God? Then eat it. And this is why a lot of Christians have gotten involved in covetousness. They feel like it's my right to live great, dress great, ride the greatest, have everything I want. I'm a child of the king. Ah, but Jesus says, if I'm truly a son of God, then I know what God knows. That it's not by these things I live. I don't live to eat. I don't live to have sex. I don't live for money or gain or advantage. That's not my life. Besides, as a son of God, I have power over these things. Not just power to obtain them, I have power to deny them. Because the fact of the matter is, if you were really a child of God, you wouldn't care about it. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. See, when you're really of God and your kingdom is in heaven, you don't care about the stuff that's on this planet. You see the difference. And how do you learn that? You learn that through fasting. Fasting teaches you Fasting reveals to you that God will sustain you. God is more valuable. God is more uh, uh, refreshing. God is more satisfying than the best food you've ever eaten. Oh, I don't know about that, Reverend. That's because you've never relied on God. You never gotten to the place where you put him before all these other things. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's better than anything you can have on this planet. But you've never stopped long enough to see. You never denied yourself the pleasures of this world to seek the pleasures that come from God. But this is what fasting teaches you. The value, the benefit, the richness. Yeah. You don't desire honey because your belly is too full, Proverbs says. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And I'm saying to you, this is how we overcome. If you fast and fast the way the Bible declares, the power of sin will be broken off of you. In fact, this is one of the promises back in Isaiah 58 and verse 6. I want to read it to you out of the NET version. It says, no, this is the kind of fast that I want. I want you to remove the sinful chains. Remove the what? Yeah, sin can be like a chain. But if you fast the right way, those chains. We sing songs. I hear the chains falling. But you know how to make those chains fall? Oh, turn that plate over. He that suffers in the flesh will cease from sin. That's the Bible. You want to break the power of lasciviousness off of your life, that spirit of fornication? You want to break the power of the sin of addiction? Yeah, opioids, marijuana, weed. Yeah, it's all in your system. You, 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 you can't get it out. It's like, man, it's all you can do. Some of you thinking about it right now. You want to break it? Some of you are addicted to gangster rap. Things that you know are just filling your spirit with all kind of corruption. But boy, you're addicted to that beat. You're addicted to the rhythm. You don't know how to stop. Oh, you turn your plate over. And you can break the power of sin off of your life. Some of you, this fast is coming up. You need to set it as your aim. I'm, I'm fasting to break the power of sin 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Oh, Romanda shit. See, the devil don't want you to do that. He says, I'll reward you. He said, there will be a reward. And it won't be no secret reward. Everybody be able to see it. You've changed. Something different. Oh, how'd that happen? I turned my plate over. And I got to fasting. It wasn't just not eating either. Oh, praise the name of God. Isaiah 58. Turn back over there. and Let's look at another one. Are y'all still with me? Isaiah 58. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? Loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. Verse 8, verse 8, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth. Oh, it take a while. No, Oof, my God, speedily. Oh, my God. So you know what he says here? If you fast the right way, I'll cause health to come forth. And you won't be recovering months and years. You speed it up. Speed it up. Speed it up. Some of you got sickness in your body. You've been praying concerning, dealing with, suffering under. It says you can fast. Until God caused your health to spring forth as a new day. Ooh, hallelujah. This, this, is what God, this is what God said. You need to open the book up and put it before the Lord. Lord, this is what you said. You said not only will you break the power of sin, you'll break the power of disease over my body. And the reason he says this, the reason he says this tells us that sometimes, say sometimes, sometimes our sickness is a result of sin. Go with me to James chapter 5. Yeah, see, this is what the enemy is not telling you. You've, you've had the prayer of faith prayed over you, but it seemed like that sickness isn't broken because what the reason why it's there. The reason why it's there isn't just because of you lack faith, isn't because of unbelief because you haven't had someone to minister to you healing, because you don't know the gospel, sometimes the reason sickness is there is because sin. Okay, I'm going to show you. See, this is something that the body of Christ don't talk about, but this is why the enemy causes us to lose faith in the power of prayer, because we don't understand that there are some things that will even keep prayer from having effects. Here, I'm going to show you. James chapter 5, verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall what? And if. That's not whenever, if. So this is sometimes. If he hath committed sin, they shall be what? Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be what? Yeah. So not just pray for one another. Sometimes we need to be confessing. Why? Because sometimes sin is a result of your disease. And I don't mean sin in general. I don't mean because, you know, Adam sinned and the curse is in the earth. No, 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 no. I'm talking about willful disobedience. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, when you sin willfully, there's no more sacrifice of sin. Meaning you're no longer uh, 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 have the blessings of the sacrifice of Christ available to you. But instead, a certain, a certain fearful indignation will come against you because God is going to punish all sin. Jesus says, if you don't forgive, your heavenly father won't forgive you, and he will cast you into prison until you have paid all. Meaning every sin has a bill on it. And if you do it willfully, that is, do it knowingly, do it like, I don't care, I'm doing it anyway, you're going to pay for that bill, God's not going to pay for it. And sometimes people spend their whole life underneath a, a curse 
because of willful dis- and why does God do that? To teach us not to blaspheme. Yeah. Paul says, I've delivered Hymenaeus over to Satan that he may learn not to blaspheme. So we will learn the danger of willfully disobeying God. Not doing it because you're weak. Not doing it because you don't know any better. Not doing it because you don't know the power of the Holy Ghost and you don't know how to activate it. No, 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 no. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You speak in tongues. You've overcome it before, but you did it because you wanted to. And you said, I'm going to do it, then I'm going to ask God to forgive me. Well, like Nathan told David, he might forgive you, but that kid is still going to die. So here's the thing. Say, I'm listening. When we as Christians willfully sin, we come under judgment, under a sentence. But here's what God says. If you throw yourself on the mercy of the court, you can get that sentence reduced or eliminated. When you prove your contrition, because the only reason why the curse is there is to teach you some contrition and humility. And when you show that, then there's no more need for the curse. Fasting helps you demonstrate, I get it. I get it. You're right, I was wrong. And humble yourself. Now you can keep going to these, to these uh, faith healers and they'll pour heal, oil all over you and it, it might come off for a week, it'll come right on back because the devil has a right because there's sin there. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, some of the things that we're, we're, we're suffering under as adults today is because, because of willful disobedience. You know, the pastor been praying and saints been praying, still can't break it. Yeah, it's probably, it's, it's, yeah. It's, oh, faith, uh, prayer doesn't work. Yes, it does. It doesn't work for willful disobedience. But you know what does work? Repentance. Fasting. Humbling yourself. Stop saying that the, the preachers need more faith and say, you know what, God, I deserve this. You're right, I'm wrong. I see now. I see. see. When you start suffering some of this stuff, nobody will have to tell you to shut your mouth. You'll shut your own mouth because you're tired of going to jail. Financial jail, physical jail, emotional jail. Your, your, the, the, your gifts are dried up. You're in jail until you repent. That's what fasting is. It's an extended repentance. It's a deep clean. I ain't getting no amens. I'm still preaching. Isaiah 58, yeah, it's the truth. Yeah, the devil don't want you to know it. But that's how you get rid of that. You need a deep clean. You need to repent. You need to ask the Lord, Lord, what is, I, yeah, you, yeah, you done forgot all about how you did that when I told you five times not to do it. And when you acknowledge your sin, he is faithful. But he can't forgive it if you won't say, you know what, this is the reason why I'm still sick right here. This is it. I, the Holy Ghost will show you. This is it right here. And you know it when they're praying for you. He'll tell you, this is it. I'm telling you, you need to repent. And we're going to see more of this. We're going to see more Christians sick. And the saints are going to be like, why is it? And listen, I'm not saying every Christian who is sick got sin in their life. Listen to me. I'm not saying that. Because you see a Christian in the hospital, don't mean they got sin in their life. But I'm saying that's not automatically not the case if you're a Christian. It could be. That's why you need to pray and ask the Lord. He'll show you. God's not interested in spanking his kids without them knowing why. I had a parent, when they, when he spunk, he's, my, my father, when he spanked me, he told me every reason. And you, when you go in there, this is for when you said this, and this, you know, he was, he was reminding me. He was reminding me why I was getting hit. This is because, and, and because. 
Isaiah 58, verse 14. This is the last one. Then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and I will watch, feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Here's the promise he gives here in this last verse of chapter 58. He says, if you fast the right way, I will give you, feed you with the heritage of your forefathers. The word heritage there is a reference to their inheritance. The things I promise to your forefathers, I'm going to give it to you. So you know what this talks about? A revival, a restoration. Joel chapter 2. Turn over there. You know what fasting will bring? Spiritual revival. Things that we lost through our wickedness, God will restore it. Mm -mm -mm. Joel 2.15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call for a solemn, a solemn assembly means a corporate fast. Everybody fast. See, some of this stuff won't be broken until we all do it. It's not enough for pastor to do it. Not enough for the elders to do it. Got to call for a solemn assembly. That is, everybody needs to be involved. What will happen when everybody fast? Verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, canker worm, caterpillar, palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. See, judgment. He says, the reason why nothing will grow in your church is because you're under sin, under judgment. But if y'all repent and get on your faith, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray and fast, I will heal the land. Heal it, not just with physical healing, spiritual healing, gifts and anointings that we've lost through our disobedience and rebellion. He'll restore it. The, the, the heritage of our forefathers, inheritance. You know, in the New Testament, what the New Testament calls part of our inheritance? The Holy Ghost. He says it's the earnest of our inheritance. The reason why we're not seeing more outpourings of the Holy Ghost is because nobody's going to fast. There used to be a time if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, they'll put you on a fast. And here's the benefit of going on a fast. He says, I will feed you with what I gave to your forefathers. And when I say forefathers, I don't mean your grandparents. I mean the apostles and the prophets that were the disciples of the Lord Jesus. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost, what he gave to that first church, I'll give to this church if they do what they did. I don't know about you, I'm looking for the heritage of my fathers. I want the anointing that was promised to them. I want it to be on this congregation. I want it to be on us. But in order for us to have what they have, we got to do what they did. It's going to take some fasting. But if we fast, church, if we turn our face to God and do what God requires... If we break the bands, cancel the debts, put away the finger, if we stop seeking our own pleasure, speaking our own words, if we stop striving against each other, quarreling, God will hear. He will say, here I am. He would say, y'all look like the people that I brought out of Egypt. Y'all look like the people that were in the upper room. I'm going to pour onto you the heritage, the promise of your father. That's the reward of fasting. Everyone standing on your feet today. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. We're coming up on an important season. This is a critical moment in our lives. And I'm asking that you would prepare us. Prepare us now for this consecration. Let us approach it with the 
right attitude and mindset. Help us, Lord, to not only abstain from food, but also to abstain from every form of wickedness. And Father, I pray that as we do that, yokes will be destroyed. Yes, chains will be broken. Healing will spring forth speedily. And spiritual renewal will be granted. Men will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Gifts of the Spirit will be given. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not like man that you should lie. If you spoke it, you shall bring it to pass. And Father, I thank you today for this word. Let it sink deep in our hearts today. And let us, Father God, offer unto you true repentance. Mm. Give us to turn away from this world and turn our faces to you and do that which is pleasing in your sight. We thank you in advance for this. We thank you in advance for this. We believe we receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Give me what to say. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519. Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love. Use me, Lord.